This is the rarest item in vanilla Minecraft, and this trade costs 65 emeralds to do, making it literally impossible. And these are 23 stupidly expensive things in Minecraft. And hey, according to the YouTube gods, no one's ever subscribed to the channel using their left pinky. So if you're up to that challenge, point your fifth digit at that red sub button below. It's free, and it helps out a ton. While this blue ice block doesn't look that expensive, let's put it in perspective. Since to get one of these, you're gonna need nine packed ice, and since the packed ice block is made out of nine ice itself, what we're really seeing here is that one blue ice block is the equivalent of 81 ice blocks like so. And when you put that side by side in a comparison, it's quickly noticeable that you're gonna be spending a lot of ice just to get that quick highway. And frankly, if you're looking to spend the time to get that much blue ice to actually get up to those top speeds, you should really be building your highway like this with the gaps, cause otherwise you're just wasting efficiency. Especially when you consider that both of these designs work the exact same. Now, this armor might look overpowered, but it's actually not that much. Since even though back in 1.14, you could get yourself a full set of armor with every single protection enchantment, that was actually unnecessary, since the level of protection for certain damage types is already capped. So even if you went through the effort of getting every single protection put on your armor, you weren't even seeing the full benefits of it. And at the very least, let's hope that when you were putting all those enchantments on, you added on mending as well. Because otherwise, I think you're gonna get the too expensive message in the anvil, and then it's a lost cause. But it is right, this definitely is too expensive. Now an efficiency 5 netherite shovel seems great, but it's actually a ripoff. Since as it turns out, having an efficiency 4 enchantment is already good enough to instant mine every shovelable block. So if you waste the time to get yourself up to efficiency 5, you're just going for style points. But honestly, I'm even guilty of this myself. It just looks awkward to have yourself an efficiency 4 right next to all your other efficiency 5 tools. But even if it's understandable, it still could be recklessly expensive to do. Now, another right beacon is a huge flex, but when you crunch the numbers, you might want to reconsider that. Since to get all the materials necessary to pull off a full netherite beacon, you would need 5,904 netherite scraps. Which, sure enough, means you're gonna have to find 5,904 ancient debris blocks, and I just can't account for that kind of luck. So if you're wadsy and want to do this for a thumbnail, that's completely fine, but for a regular person like you and me, I don't think that's gonna cut it. But hey, at least it's more blast resistant than a regular beacon. That's gotta account for something, but not the amount of time that it would take to find 5,904 netherite scrap. And when it finally comes time for you to activate that netherite beacon, the cost can only get higher. Since while most of us would choose to activate this with iron or gold, clearly those aren't the only ways to do it. Really, if you're spending a netherite ingot or a diamond to get one of these powered up, you better make sure that you have someone watching, because otherwise, you're just spending money for no one's benefit. And what's even sadder is that this isn't even the most expensive thing we can do with beacons, and we'll see that later in the video. The villager trades can be a ripoff, but this one quite literally is, since in the past, there used to be a glitch where old villagers could sometimes require more than 64 emeralds for a trade. And not only is it expensive, but it's also impossible, since you can only put up a stack of emeralds in the item slot. But nowadays, if you try to recreate this glitch, it doesn't doesn't work the same way. Since even though we have this villager in the map set with a price of 70 emeralds, the game will always auto discount it to a price of 64, which is still not cheap, but at least it's affordable, in theory. With the 1.19 update, we've got ourselves the new recovery compass item. And if you're able to track down the echo shards necessary to make one of these, it seems like a pretty useful item to have, unless you're inside of hardcore mode. Since obviously if you die here, there's no need to get pointed back to your last death, since at that point, the world's deleted and you can just move on. Odd as it may seem, this is actually the rarest block in Minecraft. And probably why that seems so odd is because it's actually pretty pointless. But in fact, since Gilded Blackstone can only generate as a part of Bastion Remnants, and usually underneath the Bastion Chests, this Golden Blackstone is actually rarer than the Ancient Debris, since that can generate anywhere. And really, when the most that you can get from this is just a handful of golden nuggets when you mine it with a pickaxe, it really makes you question whether it's worth it or not. I mean, you can't even smelt it like Nether Gold Ore to get yourself an ingot. That's how much of a ripoff this is. So is it expensive? Yes, but there's so little underlying value here that I wouldn't consider trying to get some. And speaking of showing off next to your nether portal, what well you might notice is that only big spenders are building their nether portals with the four corners, since, as we all know, it's unnecessary. I mean, even the Yogg's cast taught us that. Plus, it's not like obsidian could be easily farmed anyway, so if you're doing this, you're really just wasting time in two different ways, both in mining the obsidian and in spending the extra time to lay out those four blocks. So really, the only time you should see a nether portal built in this layout should be when you go through the nether and it generates over there. But in any other case, I'd recommend putting that four extra obsidian into an enchanted table or something. That's a lot more economical. From a distance, these palm trees look pretty unassuming, but once you get up close, then it starts to look a lot more careless. Now, I'll be the first to agree, ancient debris does look great for a palm tree trunk. And I guess one benefit is that you know that tree isn't gonna burn down in a lightning storm. But come on, the cost is obvious for building one of these things. So as much as it bothers me that Mojang hasn't added in palm trees for our beaches yet, I'd rather build one of these out of a dripstone trunk, like so, instead of wasting all this potential nether 
netherite. I mean, apparently it costs over 5,000 pieces of ancient debris to get yourself a netherite beacon, so I'd rather save up for that than wasting it on my shoreline. Every now and then, Minecraft adds a feature that doesn't make much sense, like the water breathing arrows, for instance. I mean, I don't know how often your friend is drowning, and then the solution is to deal more damage to help them out. But even if they aren't practical, at least on bedrock, we can chuck a couple of these on a slime block pusher and make ourselves a pretty fountain. As it is, leather armor is supposed to be this early game item that you can get to start off, but it almost never is, because as it turns out, it's actually more expensive to get than regular iron ingots. I mean, just consider the fact that not every cow that you kill drops leather, whereas every iron ore that I mine is always going to drop at least some amount of raw ore. And that alone means that it'll always take less mining than killing to get yourself a full set of armor. But it's also not like cows are that easy to find, so unless you find yourself a leather shirt in a shipwreck, I'd figure that most of us don't even put this on before we get into the better stuff. If you're making this flint and steel, you must be rich. Because even though a flint and steel itself is about as cheap as it gets, it costs one flint, one steel, you can hear it in the name, it is possible to get one of these with mending and breaking on it. And that's definitely reckless. I mean, sure, you will have yourself a flint and steel that'll never run out, because you can basically recharge it whenever you want, but the question then comes down to, why would you want to recharge it? The base item is so inexpensive in its own right that you're really just adding on an unnecessary cost to solve a problem that you didn't need. But if you're trying to show off while you light your nether portal, I guess flashing something like this definitely does that trick. Copper's a great block to build with, but it's also one of the most expensive. Since it's the only metal with stair and slab variants, you can only get those variants if you're using a copper block that costs 9 ingots each. Which means that just one stair made out of copper costs 13 and a half ingots to craft. Which is a lot of effort to go through for just a roof like this. And add on to that all the opportunity costs that you spent waiting for this to weather down, and the copper house that you crafted is definitely going to come with a hefty price tag. Honestly, I'd only try this if you got yourself a drowned farm, otherwise it just seems too reckless. Now, crafting an anvil definitely has its use. I'm not gonna argue with that, but crafting 64 of them to make a railing, that's where you start to lose me. But sure enough, there are some people who like to be bougie and put together some of these anvils as decoration block. And to a degree, I get it. It does have a unique model that makes it great for certain details like so. But having to spend 31 iron ingots just to get one of these, that makes it expensive even if you got yourself an iron farm. And really, if you're at the point where you're considering building this anvil floor design in survival, you might as well just save yourself some time, throw all your iron on the floor, and then crush it with that very same anvil, since both will be about the same waste of your ingots. Now, this sounds unintuitive, but you probably don't want to use bookshelves to build yourself a library, because for each one of those blocks, you're actually looking at three leather, nine paper, and six planks per block, which is expensive enough when you just need 15 of them to get a level 30 enchantment. But when you start to consider building up your library of Alexandria recreation, now you're looking at some serious problems. And honestly, I don't know if it's worth killing that many cows, causing deforestation, and getting rid of a lot of sugarcane, just to be left with a texture that's this repetitive. But if you have the farms on hand, maybe you can make this in a sustainable way. And honestly, I'd rather just craft the books outside of the bookshelves so then they have a little bit more use for me. Now, golden apples are expensive, but enchanted golden apples, that's something on a whole other level. Since if you're going through the effort to find one of these inside of a rare loot chest, it's probably gonna end up in yet another chest, except this time as a trophy. Since why would you eat one of these instead of the competition? Sure, it offers a lot of absorption hearts, but since it's a one and done thing, I'd much rather use regular golden apples or even just suspicious too for a generation. And what's funnier still is that in old versions, this enchanted golden apple actually was pretty stupid to have, making it so that you took more damage when you had an enchanted golden apple instead of less. And for the kind of cash that you were burning back then, that was pretty brutal. And arguably one of the most useful ways to use your enchanted golden apple is to make the thing banner pattern, which is expensive, but we can make it so much worse. Since to get yourself the rarest item in Minecraft, what you would have to do is get yourself a thing banner pattern and then use that in a loom so that your green banner has a brown Mojang logo. Since to do this, you would need to have cactus green dye, which you can obviously only find in a desert, and the brown of cocoa beans, which are only found in jungle biomes. And since both of those are rare biome exclusives, that makes this banner one of the most expensive things you can get in the game. And it's a shame too, because with that color combination, it truly is ugly. I think the lodestone's one of the often forgotten features of the 1.16 update. And part of that's gotta come down to its price tag. Since for each one of these that you're building, you're gonna have to get one netherite ingot, which itself is four netherite scrap, four inch and debris, and that's just too much. So while I agree it does look great if you use it in some cases for building and decoration, this should only be something you consider doing in creative mode. Because honestly, even when you use it for its intended use of linking a compass, it's not that useful for how much you're paying. But if you have enough netherite on hand that now you're trying to spend it to get the achievement, I suppose you can make an argument for that. But using it for a build like this, I'm not gonna co-sign that one. This might not look like much, but what you're actually seeing here is the result of 16,384 blocks that we placed. Since to get one thing of custom map art, 
it's gonna be a 128 by 128 map. And when you crunch the numbers, that quickly starts to ramp up in time. And that's not even including the fact that you could be using supporting blocks to get the staircase in effect for shading. So as much as I love showing off custom map art in our videos for the cool details like so, if you're actually in survival and you're trying to use one of these for a chessboard or a custom carpet, it's not the most economical choice, let's put it at that. While beacons clearly have a lot of function as a, well, beacon, they do also give off a light source, which we can extrapolate to mean that you can use beacons exclusively as a light source inside your base. But why you would ever do this, it's beyond me. Because each one of these blocks that you place down tells the story that you killed a wither for each nether star inside. Which is pretty cool, but as soon as you see a beacon chandelier like this, <laughs> then it starts to feel excessive. And honestly, if you're gonna use a beacon for decoration, I'd much rather use it for colorful beacon beams. Because at least then, the beacon could be active instead of just passive like so. Now, I agree, the dragon egg is pretty much useless. But even with that said, using one of these for the base of a lamp still seems like a waste. I mean, in Java Edition, you're only gonna get one of these. So the idea that you'd just be using it for something as simple as a light up base, yeah, I don't know, it rubs me the wrong way. Let's put it at that. But if you're really set against using one of these in your trophy room, then at the very least, my favorite reckless way of using your dragon egg is by putting it inside of an item frame and using it as the nose on a sign. Silly, yes, but stupid, also yes. There's a lot of arguments, but what's the best fuel to use in a furnace, but I can safely say this is the worst. Since while it doesn't look that bad to put your jukebox in as a furnace fuel, consider the underlying cost. Since for each one of these jukeboxes, you're spending one diamond inside. And there you go, just by putting a jukebox in the furnace, you're literally burning money. And I doubt you can recoup that cost by selling whatever steak you cooked in that furnace. Honestly, I think you'd have to pay me to eat a steak made out of diamonds instead of the other way around. And honestly, jukeboxes by themselves already feel like a ripoff. We don't need to add to that equation. If you're really looking to take your items for a spin, then there's really nothing that matches up to a honey block roundabout. The way it works is that items are dispensed in the back and then pushed around on the honey blocks in circles by the pistons. While it really just amounts to a pretty show, I've got no problems with that. It is kind of mesmerizing to watch. And it's worth noting for the sake of being thorough that even if all the items don't get collected at the front, then they still get picked up in the back and then funneled into the system. That little tidbit isn't going to make it any more practical, but it is worth noting because, hey, at least it's functional. So if you got a rumble in your tumbly for all kinds of weird storage, then this is definitely the best you'll find in the entire 100 acre wood. With piglin bartering, gold farms are a very helpful thing to have on hand. And while we normally build these above the bedrock roof, some servers patch out that glitch. So why not just get thousands of blocks of obsidian and build an overworld gold farm? And while you do sacrifice some of the efficiency to pull this off, it is quite the feat to build inside your world, and it'll finally give a use to that obsidian farm you have, so that's something. But honestly, why would you want to do more work for less results. I've got no clue. Corralling animals in Minecraft is easier said than done. Let's just say the AI is in a perfect system. And while crops should be the easy solution, not all of us have a farm on hand. So for another solution, we could use a flint and steel. No joke, by lighting the mob on fire and placing a water source in the pen, you can bait them towards that spot to cool off. It does work, but it only takes the pig being a bit too slow before you're left with little more than a pork chop and a waste of time. Before you get an elytra, it's not an easy task to cross the different void gaps between the islands in the end. Though, that painful problem actually has an enjoyable solution. You see, as Simply Sark pointed out in 2018, another alternative is mixing together Riptide, Slow Falling, and Ender Pearls, then you can launch yourself hundreds of blocks needed to cross. Which is fun, but only right until the point where you need to get back. And then, it's a pain building the system again. So honestly, I'd much rather just fill up my inventory with stacks of cobblestone or something. At least then, the bridges that I make would be reusable. Unlike this, where it's one and done. Staircases are a staple in a Minecraft house, and they're also very customizable. Some are fancy, some are straightforward, some go up to build limit, and this one, this one's just long. Or, more specifically, one of the longest staircases currently possible in vanilla Minecraft. If you thought snow layer staircases were slow, then this puts that all to shame. And really, for the effort to set all of this up, only to climb one block, it's just sad, and definitely not practical. And I don't know what lunatic would want to put this to work in their house. We barely wanted to build it for the example. Dealing a lot of damage in Minecraft is satisfying, but while it might sound like a dream to kill the Ender Dragon in one hit, the reality of building something like this is just a nightmare. You see, even though this crazy TNT arrow launcher might just do the trick, you'd have to be a mad person to build it. Even in creative mode, this seems like it would take a lot of effort to make. So truly, if you're looking for speed while you kill the dragon, just use beds. Speedrunners have already proved that's plenty fast for getting the fight done. 
Bone meal farms are almost a prerequisite for Minecraft automation. After all, who wants to wait for all their crops to grow on their own? But if you can't find a skeleton spawner nearby, then I guess fish are always a solution. Though the word solution here seems like a bit of an overstatement. You see, in Java Edition, there's only a 5% drop chance of bone meal from these things. Folks, that's not a bone meal farm. It's a fish farm with a bone meal bonus. So if you really can't find a spawner and you're still looking for bone meal some way, just use cactus or kelp instead. At least with those, you have luck on your side. With the popularity of 100 days challenges in Minecraft, it's become a lot more crucial to check your in-game time. And while most of us would do that through the F3 debug menu, there's actually a way to do this with redstone. See, using a daylight sensor on top of a dispenser filled up with blocks, then every time another day passes by, a block goes into the chest and tells you the number. I mean, it's certainly a lot more costly than hitting a button on a keyboard, but if you want to, it's worth a shot. When you're smelting things in a furnace, you don't always have to be standing there to watch it all get done. So to know when it's time to sub in a new item to smelt, you could make this system that plays a little tune every time that the furnace finishes cooking. Which, I mean, does work and it's a nice little detail, but really, just use a hopper and then you can have all of this super smelter system work without any of the hassle for you. And look, in all honesty, I actually like this redstone system. That's why we've shown it off in the past. But does it pass the practicality test? Not exactly. Say you come across some diamonds while mining, but you don't have a way to get across the lava lake. Well, no worries, because you happen to have all 244 mineral blocks necessary to make a full jump boost to beacon. And after setting that up and the proper skylight to make the beacon work, you power it on and jump across with newfound strength to the other side. Yeah, it's a common occurrence, I know. And while it does work in execution, the theory has so many holes in it that I really don't see this as much more than a what-if scenario. Throwing items on the floor is a pretty shoddy way of storing them. I mean, after all, they are going to despawn in five minutes, and I don't think anyone wants that to happen to their netherite pickaxe. That is, unless you build a system like this. The way that this works is that we have one junk item getting pushed onto a pressure plate and then the other one that we have being demonstrated out front, which means that as soon as the dirt despawns, the pressure plate gets untriggered and then the diamond is able to be sucked back in. That way, the valuable item that we're showcasing never actually despawns, it just keeps getting cycled through hoppers and droppers. Honestly, I don't know why you'd use this over an item frame, but sure enough, if you want to show off your item, in a trophy case, this is a pretty bougie way of doing it. Anyone who's ever come across a silverfish spawner knows that these suckers love to crawl inside of blocks. And while most of the time that's just a pain to deal with, strange as it may seem, we can actually use it for mining. Yeah, no joke, all you gotta do is anger one of them and that'll cause the rest of them to break out of their blocks and join in. Meaning, essentially, we can dig a hole without a pickaxe. But in practice, it's just ridiculous. So even though it works, the cost to your sanity to pull this off might be too high to pay. Look, I love flying machines as a concept. It's a great feat of redstone engineering and especially when you're trying to do something crazy like a moving base or a house. However, while these might work for those kind of displays, I don't understand using them for travel. I mean, just about anything will outclass these for horizontal travel, and unfortunately, they're not much better for vertical. In our Sky Limit testing video, we found out that one of these as an elevator works just about as fast as pillaring up one block at a time. And for all the hassle to set up this system, that's pretty disappointing. If you would rather sort through your items manually instead of having the help of a hopper, then this is definitely the method for you. You see, the way this sort of item shower works is that the droppers shoot out all of their items onto the floor and then you as the player go in and then sort through what you want. Don't worry about leaving any mess on the floor, it's all gonna get sorted out in a second. Because as soon as you got all the items you need, you can then press this button and all the floor scraps will get sent right back into the funnel in the system. Personally, this takes me right back to the golden days of Hunger Games, where right after you kill someone, you gotta sort through their old inventory as fast as you can. And believe me, using one of these in your survival world is just as stressful and terrible of a concept as it is there. Now, when you first look at them, minecart chests aren't that weird. I mean, it's a minecart and it's in a chest. It seems like it lives up to the name. But where the storage really gets strange is when you stack a whole bunch of minecart chests into the same block. As it goes, since these things are actually entities instead of blocks, you can stack up a whole bunch of them on top of one hopper. Meaning if you've got a way to put items in and retrieve them out, then you've got one of the most compact mass storage systems in the game. For my money, I can say this is a pretty nifty way to store all the items that you get from a farm. And it definitely looks a lot nicer than those huge storage silos you have to build. Just make sure your computer can handle all the new entities getting loaded in. They can get laggy real fast. Emeralds are the quintessential Minecraft currency, and while there are plenty of ways to get your hands on the green stuff, this one might be the lamest. The truth is, folks, if you want a slow burn emerald farm, then foxes are your prime choice. Every now and then, these things will snag an emerald for you, which you can then replace to them with a food item. It's simple to set up, that's for sure, but it's also remarkably tedious. Which, call me crazy, but something tells me this isn't your next ticket to a full emerald beacon. You might need to look 
elsewhere for that. In most of our worlds, item frames just function as a decoration. I mean, they're even labeled as such, even Mojang agrees. But that's selling them kind of short, because if we actually use these as storage, they do function as such. The way that you would have this works by having a dispenser shoot out an arrow at the item that you want to retrieve, and then have it funnel back to you. Or if you want to be a little more precise about it, then you could just use your own bow and arrow to shoot it off the wall. To me, this reminds me of those old corny carnival games that we used to play. And personally, I like being able to shoot my tools off the wall at a moment's notice. The only problem is it's not that fun of a system to set back up. But that's just how life goes. It's way more fun to destroy than it is to clean up. Now, this might be one of the most unique forms of item storage, because in fact, we're not actually storing items, but rather we convert them into items on request. So for example, we hook this up to a farm where if you want sugarcane, you then press a button and then deliver sugarcane to you. Or you would have TNT blow up different stone blocks and the like to then deliver those to you as well. As you can see, the key difference here between other storage is that the items actually didn't exist until we pressed the button to call for them. And of course, the limitation that would come with this system is that you couldn't use it for all items. But if you want your sugarcane freshly harvested at a moment's notice, then there's really nothing that can top this. Now, I'm all for saving time when you can, but sometimes finding the fastest path takes more time than it's worth. For an example, let's look at the Wither fight. Sure, there's some impressive ways to take down the thing, whether with firework rockets or falling dripstone, but while those do a lot of damage in a short burst, they aren't exactly easy to get. So why go through all of that effort when we could just trap it under the end's bedrock fountain? Especially when, to even pull off those crazy methods, you probably need it stuck in place anyway. Most are familiar with this trick that we use to break through the bedrock roof, but we can use it elsewhere. Since this gets rid of any block that's underneath the piston, we could even get rid of end portal frames or command blocks through this method. Although, bedrock is the only practical option here. For example, if you want to break the end portal, you could just break the frames using a big mushroom. And that's so much easier than this setup. So while I guess this could be used on obsidian, let's be honest here. The slow setup barely makes me want to use this in the nether, let alone in the overworld. Just leave it to bedrock and call it there. Making an infinite water source is an easy concept, but not everyone always walks around with two full water buckets. So if you're in a place like the desert at the end, you're out of luck. Unless, of course, you have a cauldron and some glass bottles on hand, because then you can't find a solution. Just fill the bottles up in the water source, pour them into the cauldron, and fill it up to the brim. Then you can take out the new source block with your water bucket and make a traditional infinite water pool. So this would work, but it's so much more expensive than the regular method, and should only be highly situational. Now, I've sung the phrases of the cake ladder too many times to count, and while it does add a fair amount of speed with the right horse, is it practical? <laughs> no, not at all. The amount of cake that you need to make for this thing should be illegal. It definitely feels like a crime laying it all out in the crafting table. And then, to not only have your cake, but then eat it too, that makes this build more of a fantasy than anything. But it's a fantasy that'll still happily use, in creative mode. While riding into battle on horseback sounds great, Minecraft doesn't always make it that fun. Say, for example, you wanted to go through the effort and make yourself the perfect horse for travel. But starting off, it's not even the fastest method. And also, you don't get a clear stat readout for each horse, so you're gonna have to test them and compare yourself. And after putting in all that effort into both the breeding and the math to get the perfect stud steed, you're still pretty limited by most standards. So just stick to an elytra or an ice boat. Those are a lot easier to tame. If you're trying to get down from a mountain without a water bucket on hand, then there might be another avenue for you to choose, which is that if for some reason you're lacking a bucket but brought along TNT, then that's enough to do the trick for safe landing. Since they're instantly broken with a fist, you can break one and then place the other from your inventory without ever skipping a beat, which I'll admit is fun to pull off as a party trick. But all it takes is one wrong move or a blaze this fireball in the nether to turn this whole thing belly up. So just stick to water and hay bales. Swords are great for taking out different mobs, but when you get low on durability, the pressure is sure to set in. So if you don't want to worry about that, dragging around a bunch of iron golem bodyguards can also do the trick. And while I love how silly it is to bring around an iron golem posse to do your dirty work, all it takes is one creeper to roll around and the fun will end there. And honestly, for the 36 iron it takes to craft one of these things, I'd rather just make a sword and armor and do the job myself. Frostwalker isn't the most necessary Area of Minecraft enchantments. So if you've already got a pair, then the answer might be to give it to a villager instead. No joke, by using a dispenser, you can give it to a villager and then tuck them in a pack of mobs to easily move the horde across the ocean, which winds up being a lot easier than doing 19 trips in a boat. Every now and then, you've got to break the laws of physics. And while Minecraft doesn't exactly abide by gravity, that doesn't mean we can't break its own rules too. And one of my favorite ways to do that might just be these so-called illegal water and lava source blocks. After laying out the proper arrangement of sticky pistons and redstone, we can just about glitch out the game. And then, even after removing the surrounding blocks, we can still interact with these as normal source blocks. So if you're looking for a floating art piece to put in your base, this might do the trick.
back. Now, saving yourself from a fall with a water bucket is nothing new. And if you ask me, it's been done to death. So how about we try to get a bit more creative for our MLG save and turn to potions instead? No joke, using something like a slow falling potion, we're capable to make a safe landing from a dangerous fall. And to pull this off, the technique isn't too different from what it is for the water bucket, since it all hinges on pressing right click at the right time. And if you do that, your legs will thank you. Chainmail is a cool concept, but it doesn't serve much of a gameplay function. And it's definitely not worth using over that iron set that you're already wearing. But if you have a helmet from a zombie's rare drop, let's use it before you lose it. And if you put one of these on an armor stand like so, it makes a nifty RGB keyboard for your next house's desk. Now, lecterns are not something you need to craft in bulk, but if you happen to misclick in a crafting grid, don't sweat it. Here's the solution. Since these share the same bottom texture as the oak planks, we can make something of a rotated pattern in your roof, which I'll admit is a lot better than leaving these lying in a chest. The way that Minecraft is, it's really easy to build a pillar, but really awkward to build downwards. And without a water source to cling to, most of us might think that such a thing is impossible, but that's just not true. If we just so happen to have two trap doors on hand, then we can use this crawl technique like so to slowly maneuver ourselves down the path. Is it tedious? Absolutely. But the fact still remains that if you need to build downwards in a pinch, this might be your best bet. Bats are notorious for not doing much, and while they can help to find caves, there's not much use for these on the surface. That is, until we add in an invisibility potion. As others have pointed out, these little flying rats can become something to ghost when they're invisible, letting us get both the flying particle effects and the spooky sounds for your haunted house build. So Mojang has gone on the record against adding in vertical slaps, which has spawned its fair share of debates. And while I'm not trying to argue either side, I will mention that, for what it's worth, it is a little possible right now. See, through the help of walls and TNT, it's possible to glitch out the block's connectivity and leave a vertical slab floating like so. Now, it's not easy enough to do to justify putting a bunch of these in your build, but it is a cool way to break Mojang's rules. And if you ask me, it's worth doing just for that. Before you get mending on your elytra, phantoms are your only option for a restock, but some servers have insomnia disabled, making that way less viable. So instead of doing something simple like enabling those game rules, you could always just turn to a cat gift farm instead. Just place a cat over a hopper next to your bed, sleep for the night, and you'll get the membrane just the same. It's not exactly a speedy farm, but I guess it does save you the hassle of complaining to the admin, for whatever that's worth. Snow layers can add a good bit of detail to your winter build, but they're a pain to craft in bulk. So a much weirder plan B could be to get a whole bunch of snow golems walking, or rather dragging, around the place to coat it in snow powder, which to a degree, I guess is more resource effective, but the time that it would take to move all of these around is a big commitment. And even then, it's kind of like the fill tool in Photoshop. Good for filling out a big area, but I would hate to use this to write my name. Before barrels were added into the game, you were pretty limited on how you got to do your storage. That is, unless you wanted to get creative with it. Because sure enough, chests aren't the only containers in the game, and if we look at it, you can actually use dispensers as a way to store your items. Now I know, it's not ideal. They definitely don't have a lot of storage. But I'll fully admit that in times where I didn't have wood, I've definitely put together some cobblestone and redstone to make some droppers or dispensers to store my items. But possibly the best use that I've seen of this is making a dispenser or dropper floor, because it basically looks like cobblestone, and then storing your item in between the floorboards. That way, unless your visitors are extra vigilant, they're not going to be checking out your diamonds. Minecraft has plenty of different blocks that function as containers, in which that you're able to place an item inside of them, and then they'll keep that item inside. Things like chests, barrels, dispensers, hoppers, any of that. And while I would initially think that furnaces are the most limited, that all gets thrown out the window when you factor in brewing stands. These things cannot do a lot. They got one inventory slot, and it's only for potion ingredients. So if you're a practicing witcher warlock who wants to hide their golden carrots in a place that no one will ever find, there you go. But for the rest of us regular people, I think it's probably best to use brewing stands for, well, brewing. They're much better sorted for that job. Normal hostile mobs do not mix well with water. So sure, that means that you could spawn proof your base using water instead of torches. But let's compare the two. One of them offers light and provides a warm, safe atmosphere, while the other makes it wet, a pain to walk through, and doesn't exactly mix nice with your redstone or decorations. And really, the only reason I would want to do this is for a Riptide Trident to use wherever I go. That'd be the only nice touch. But other than that, maybe this is further proof that you should just have an aquarium in your house instead of turning your house into the aquarium. 
Most of the time in Minecraft, hoppers are the journey and not so much the destination. But if we want to flip that whole concept on his head, we can actually use hoppers in a sort of carousel motion to then get our items circling around. By doing this, we can make our own form of item rotation circus to always keep your favorites in the loop. But what's important to know is that if you do build this, you should only have one item per hopper. That way you can prevent any kind of buildup in your system. Because hey, who wants a traffic jam anyway? And while doing this arguably makes hoppers even less valuable for storage, it is nice to know that sometimes you don't have to worry about where you're going and just enjoy the ride. Gold tools don't get a lot of playtime. However, as some commenters are quick to point out, they can be faster than their diamond counterparts. And while that's true, as soon as you enchant the two candidates, that's all thrown out the window. An Efficiency 5 Diamond Pickaxe is much faster than the gold counterpart. And while that's enough of a reason to use this, the difference in durability means that you'll burn through way more golden pickaxes just to mine the same amount of area. So while Unenchanted gives the nod to gold, just spend your levels in time to get a fully enchanted pickaxe instead. Look, I'm a fan of getting the best bang for your buck, but at some point, we gotta ask if it's worth it. Take this Regeneration Beacon, for example. Now, the way that it is, you don't get the full regeneration from this thing after a while of being activated, which is too bad, but we could fix it with a system to deactivate and reactivate the thing repeatedly. And I get that that would help you to regain your life slightly faster, but I imagine any time that you save was already wasted on building this thing in the first place. Piston doors look great, but they can be frustrating to set up, and sometimes you might just want to blow it all up and start from scratch. So why not make that a feature? If you're crazy enough to piece together a cobblestone generator wall, then you can use a TNT button system to bust through and use it as a door. Sure, this still uses pistons, but it's a lot more of a spectacle, to say the least. Just make sure you don't step too close, otherwise this will double as a defense system. If you're into redstone, or maybe you just want a bunch of leads, then a slime farm is on your to-do list. But if you're playing on peaceful mode, then it would seem that you're out of luck. That is, until you manage to capture a few hundred pandas. You see, these mobs, even in peaceful, will occasionally sneeze out a slime ball, giving you somewhat of a farm. But don't get it twisted, this method is painfully slow. So if you really want to build this, enjoy the two or three slime balls you might get in your entire lifetime, because that's about it. You ever get tired of placing your own pumpkins? Yeah. I don't either, but any person really looking to automate their pumpkin placing process, I guess this does do the trick. With two snow blocks out of reach from the dispenser, it'll still try to place the pumpkin for a snow golem, even if it wouldn't make one. And then, there you have it, an automatic pumpkin placing machine, which I guess is functional, but I do not understand the point of using this trick. And honestly, it's probably more useful to use the intended method of making snow golems anyway. And with that folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video, so see if they're right and have a good one, alright?